Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you've all got full bellies and you've had a nice, nice lunch together and um, you've all discussed Christian's message this morning and we've all taken it on board and all had a good time together at, at, at lunch. I was going to go straight into the, announce, uh, the, the welcome, but I need to make a, just a, a quick announcement again for our for our local members. Um, word is already starting to get out, but I need to share. Um, our sister Margaret Booker was hit by a car this morning, a um, car that was backing out of a driveway. Um, she didn't see it, car didn't see her, and the two don't mix very well. So she's up at hospital at the moment. Um, several, several breaks. I don't have full details. Didn't hit her head, so that's a blessing. But um, yeah, more more news will come come through. But please please remember Marg in in your prayers at the moment. Yeah, and um, we'll we'll share more as as time comes. So I, f- I felt we we needed to needed to mention that as a church and acknowledge that. But today is is a happy day. It's a, it's a celebration today. So um, today is, of course, the ordination of Daniel, and we're all here for that. You know, Jesus said in, in Matthew and Luke, he spoke with a mustard seed, something very small, but it had a big effect. And to use a, one of my, my, one of my favorite secular songs, um, you might know it by Paul Kelly, from little things, big things grow. And I, 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 I like that song and I enjoy the words. But I think as we look at Daniel's journey, we can, we can acknowledge these things from, from little things, big things have grown. And it's, it's wonderful. I, 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 let, I met uh, Lauren at lunch today and I know she was, she was there when a book was handed to Daniel that triggered a few things. And, and who knows, the, the faithfulness of each one of us, you hand a book to someone, you answer a question, you, you, you share a thought and the ripple effect later on. And today we see a big ripple effect. So this afternoon doesn't mark the start of Daniel's journey and it doesn't mark the end of Daniel's journey, but it certainly marks a big chapter, the start of a chapter in Daniel's journey. So as friends and family and as peers, we, we're here to witness and to celebrate that. So at this point, there's some special welcomes and acknowledgements that we should, we should make for the people who are in Daniel's life, um, who, are, who have made time out of their busy schedules to, to be here today to, to celebrate and I suppose run this ordination service. So Graham, Graham and Marcy. On the, on the piano, thank you. Of course, Graham, president of the, our local Victorian conference, so we thank you. It's always a pleasure when you guys come. Craig, oh, I, sh- I should know where everyone's sitting on. <laughs> I know he's around somewhere. There he is. Thank you, Craig. So uh, Daniel's given me a little detail. Uh, Craig was Daniel's pastor very soon after his baptism and encouraged and support, support him towards his, his ministry. So welcome, Craig. Justin. We welcome you, uh, Ministerial Secretary for the Victorian Conference. Brendan, we welcome you, mate. Good to see you. The Ministerial, Ministerial Secretary for the Australian Conference. I'd be no good at that. Couldn't say it. Um, Suki, Suki Guna Til Eka. Am I close? C- cool. <laughs> Daniel wanted me to mention you. Um, he's played, you played a key role in bringing him to the faith and your spiritual guidance, so an acknowledgement, thank you. Christian Kopachanu, yeah. I have, I messed it up this morning if you weren't here. Christian, who who baptised Daniel, so that's always special, that's always special. And we thank you for the distance you've travelled today, Christian. Um, Michael Mahanu, uh, thank you for you and your wife, Carmen, for, for coming down and for your um, supervising Daniel during his internship and, and the journey you've had there. The song leaders, thank you for, thank you for coming in and sharing with us today. And 
what you've done for Daniel in his growth and faith and how you've helped him as well. And also, um, although he's not here in person, uh, Johnny Wong will, will have a little clip who will also present something. These are people in Daniel's lives that um, we need to mention and thank. But of, but of course, um, we need to mention Daniel's family, most of all, and to Stephanie and, and the two young kids and the extended family who I know here are well. And, now, and it all goes into the, what's the saying, it takes a village to, to raise. Oh, no, I've messed that up already, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but behind, behind um, every passer, he needs a support team, and, that, and that's the family. So we thank you for that as well. Um, so, yes, it's, it's a privilege and honour to be, to be up here to welcome you all today, and we, we look forward to the presentation. It is a special day for all of us. Our local church pastor is becoming ordained, and we um, take pride in that as, as, as well as anyone. So, again, welcome, and um, I'd like to invite, I believe our singers are coming up. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's our pleasure to be here today, and we are not regulars here, so I thought I would just introduce who we all are. So our song team today is Julian, Leanne, Suki, and myself, Lauren. We're friends of Daniel. Then this is Daniel's brother, John, and nephew, Jehoiada. And on the piano, we have Mrs. Christian. So we'd like to invite you all to join with us by rising and singing our first hymn for today, Day by Day. This is a song which expresses beautifully Daniel's trust in the Lord.
Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Sabbath. My name is Suki. Um, if you have a program, the longer version of my name is Sukeshini, but it's a little bit difficult to pronounce. <laughs> so my name is Suki. Um, this afternoon, Daniel has asked me to share his ministry history. Um, now, if you've got a program, um, the ministry history is actually in your program. Um, but he wanted to share me to share with you uh, a more personal perspective. I was telling Daniel at lunch this afternoon that I've known him now for 13 years. Um, I can't believe it. Um, when we, when Lauren and I first met Daniel on campus, he was, I think, a first-year student at Monash. Um, but before I get ahead of myself, I want to begin by just sharing um, a little bit about Daniel's history um, and his background before we, we met him. Uh, Daniel comes from a family that's very close-knit um, and very spiritual. I remember when we first met his parents uh, and his siblings. He has five siblings five siblings. And um, when we first met them, one thing that I was really struck by is how close-knit um, that family is um, and how the, the parents and the kids have such an amazing open relationship. I was really blessed to see that interaction. Um, Daniel's parents are godly, prayerful people. Uh, but more than that, I think one thing that strikes me about um, his parents is that they're people that are always open to hearing the opinions and ideas of their kids, even if they don't agree with those opinions and ideas. Uh, Daniel's um, parents are uh, Presbyterians, um, but they're, they're, there's just such an openness to hearing, especially religious discussions in their home. And that really uh, was a blessing for, for me to see when I met them. But also his siblings, they are so close-knit um, and so varied. Um, and so that, Daniel's family, was a huge um, impact, a huge influence in his life, and also the foundation for his spirituality. Um, if you read the, uh, the uh, ministry history here, Daniel talks about how he um, grew up um, in the Presbyterian church, and from a very young age, he knew that he wanted to be a pastor, a minister. Um, but there was, I don't know, different struggles in it, um, different um, places where he questioned himself, um, but one thing that he talks about here, and he mentioned this even in his testimony when we first heard it, when he got baptized, that one thing that stood out to him, one thing that impacted him was a discipleship course that he did by uh, Bill Gothard at that time. And um, that really helped him to understand the idea of discipleship. And I think discipleship is something that's really, really important to a Christian, especially a young believer. Uh, especially when you grow up in the church, you grow up in a family that's godly, it's really easy to lean on your parents' spirituality. Um, but I think the turning point for Daniel to kind of forge his own personal spiritual experience was during the um, Basic Life Principles course that they did as a family. Uh, fast forward a few years, and um, this is the really this is the part where where I can really speak to, um, because, and a stranger. So in in the the, the um, in his testimony, he writes, a stranger handed Daniel a book called Disciple by one Carlos Oritz, um, and it advocated a radical faith. Daniel was really pleased by it, and he prayed and he promised God that the next person to give him a book, he would accept. That was, that was what he prayed. Now, unbeknownst to Daniel, Lauren and I had just started Bible working at Monash University. We, were, um, we had previously been at Swinburne Uni, and um, it was tough going. Uh, we, we'd planted a church at Swinburne Uni, but it was tough going, and we transferred to Monash to see if, you know, the ground at Monash was uh, more... <laughs> I don't know, fruitful than <laughs> Swinburne at the time. And that particular, one particular morning, it was September or October. And if you've been to the Monash Uni Clayton campus, when it gets cold and windy, there's a place in front of the Matheson Library that's like a wind tunnel. And what we'd done is we just started Bible working on that campus. It was the second semester, and Lauren and I would set up a table in front of the Matheson Library. Matheson is the main arts library. And it's windy and it's cold. It's pretty miserable to Bible work there when it's like in spring, you know, when the weather's really unpredictable. That particular morning, we were supposed to Bible work. And I remember waking up and thinking, I really don't want to go to work. 
because it was cold and I was tired and I was just like, oh, I don't want to go. But then I thought, if I don't go, I can bail on Lauren. That's not going to be good. That's why we Bible work in pairs, right? Because <laughs> if you, 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 there's somebody to keep you accountable. And I thought, oh, I can't bail on Lauren. So I got up, got dressed, and I was running late. And I was running out the door. And I, I won't forget this because I was putting my shoes on. I was thinking, I'm so late. And I was balancing my bag and balancing my breakfast. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, take a copy of The Great Controversy with you. And I thought, that's really weird. Like, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was a nudge. And I thought, that's just so random. I don't have time for that. And I was out the door. And again, this nudge came, take a copy of The Great Controversy. So I unlocked the door, went back in, grabbed my personal copy, and I went on campus. Lauren and I were setting up the table. It, we were running our first evangelistic campaign at Monash Uni. We just set up a club there, and it was a uh, three-part series called Why Sunday? Uh, we were deciding to run a three-part series on the Sabbath and the change of the Sabbath. And we had these brochures, and we set up the table, and I had gone into the library to get something, like a stapler or something, and I came back, and Lauren was talking to this boy. And the first thing I thought is, thank you, Jesus, because we had been at that table for weeks, and we were always sitting up there, and always socialist alternative was set up in front of us, right? Always socialist alternative was set up in front of us, and they'd be really aggressive, so like they'd fan out in front of us, and you know, they'd just not like us, because we'd put like a Bible school sign there, and they were like, you know, they were socialist alternative. And so they were aggressive, and I was like, I cannot do another day just watching socialist alternative be aggressive. And there was this person that Jesus sent to our Bible school table. I was like, thank you, Jesus. You knew I needed this, in this you know, like encouragement. And so we, I went and <laughs> poor Daniel, we were like, praise the Lord. He's, the Lord sent us this boy. And so we were talking to him and Daniel was, you know, very calm, but very aloof. You know, he was just, <laughs> yeah, okay, Bible school. Cause he'd never seen a Bible school table in front of the Matheson. And, um, and so we were like, okay, praise the Lord. Now we got to give him all our resources. Would you like a brochure? Would you like a DVD? Would you like a... And he's like, no, no, I, I already decided that I'm not going to take any literature from anybody. No, I don't want a brochure. And so then we're thinking, but Lord, you brought him to us. Like, why? For no reason? Like, he doesn't want to take anything. And then Lauren had a brilliant idea. Lauren's like, can we pray with you, Daniel, before you go? Because, and I think both of us were thinking this, well, the Lord sent us this boy at least if we pray, we're going to sow some seeds. He's going to know there are Adventists here, right? And so we told him we're Adventists. And so while we were praying, again, the Holy Spirit nudged me, give him the book. And I remember thinking, he didn't even take like a brochure. Why would he take the book? And again, the Holy Spirit nudged me, give him the book. And so after we finished praying, I said, Daniel, if I gave you a book, would you take it? Now, remember, he'd already promised God the next person who gave him a book, he would take it. It so happened to be me. And I said to him, would you take the book? And he said, yeah, I'll take a book. And I remember thinking, he'll take the book, but he won't take the brochure, whatever. Okay, so here's the book. And so he, he, he read it. He came for our seminar, and that seminar was a prophecy seminar. Johnny Wong was preaching that seminar. And Daniel was really blessed by uh, what Johnny was preaching on, on Bible prophecy. And he, he told me, I need to return this book to you. Because I met him at the, the seminar. He's like, I need to return the book because it's your personal copy. I said, no, keep it, <laughs> just keep it. He's like, no, I've read it and I'm really, I really believe everything that's in the book. And we were just blown away. Um, and then he came to church and he wanted to have Bible studies. And at that time, uh, Christian was our pastor. And we were like, Christian kind of revolutionized all of us, right? I know he'd laugh at it, but we'd been listening to his sermons and he'd been just preaching so much on just righteousness by faith. And we were just so blown away by it. And so I remember we were like, oh, Daniel needs to study with Christian. Like totally, Daniel needs to study with Christian. And um, true enough, Christian was a real blessing to Daniel. And if you read it, he talks about how Christian helped him to see salvation by faith. And uh, that's something that's so vital to a Christian experience. And Christian gave us that, and he gave Daniel that too, and we were really blessed by that. And after that, um, Daniel decided that he wanted to Bible work. And it was a real blessing for us because, um, you know, we started, Daniel got baptized in 2010, Christian baptized him. And then that year, a year later, you know, 
a year later, where Daniel had been standing on the other side of the table asking us questions, a year later, he was standing on this side of the table uh, sharing with others. And it was such a blessing for Lauren and me, for our whole church family to just see how God, what God did in Daniel's life. And Daniel continued to Bible work. Um, Daniel and I Bible worked together at Monash for, for many years after that. And it was not always easy, Bible working at Monash. Bible working at a secular university is never easy. I remember uh, one time we, uh, we ran this evangelistic series and we were handing out brochures on evolution called Monkey Business. And we had people like lay into us and swear at us and tell us to get off campus. And it was, it was, it was challenging. And yet we kept going because we had people like Daniel. And we knew that if there's one Daniel on campus, there's got to be more, right? Um, and it was a blessing because Daniel was able to then Bible work, uh, lead out in care group, share by, give Bible studies to others. But he never forgot his focus, his passion on being a minister. Um, and after he graduated from Monash, he went to Avondale. He studied and uh, he entered the ministry. Um, he worked under Pastor Michael Mohanu, and I think he's made special mention of Pastor Mohanu's kindness and compassion and willingness to work with him. Um, and yeah, Daniel is going to be ordained today. And you know, it's, it's really, it's an amazing thing. When I saw the Facebook invite come up, uh, Daniel's ordination, I was like, I told my husband, we're going. Like, even if it had been on the moon, we would have gone. Because, you know, it was, God sent Daniel to us at a time in our ministry when we needed to know that Jesus was leading us. And Daniel was God's gift to us. Um, and we are so grateful that he sent, God sent Daniel to us at that time, not just to encourage us, but also um, it's an amazing thing to think that Daniel's now a pastor and he's going to be ordained. Um, it's such a testament to the power and the glory of God and how God can use anyone. If you listen to Daniel's story, I think one thing that really stands out to me is how God used different people at different times in Daniel's life. His parents and his siblings were such a massive part of his foundation. Um, God sent us to just put a book in his hand. You know, what if, uh, in his baptismal testimony, Daniel said, what if they hadn't gone to work that day? And it's so true. What if we hadn't gone to work? Because, you know, I was thinking, I don't want to go to work today. But what if we hadn't, you know? Uh, and then God brought... Um, Christian to share with him about righteousness by faith, brought Johnny to share with him about Bible prophecy, brought Pastor Mohanu to mentor him in his ministry. And I'm sure God has brought so many other people into Daniel's life as well. But it's such a humbling thing to realize that God uses us to minister to others. Um, and then through us ministering to someone else, then that person pays it forward by ministering to others in turn. And so, Daniel, thank you for um, giving me the privilege of sharing about you. Um, I am so honored to be here, and we will continue to pray for what God is going to do in your life. And we praise God for you and for um, what he has done in your life so far. Thank you. Air Force fighter pilot. All of my life, I wanted to be an Air Force fighter pilot. Life of adventure and speed and uh, zooming all over the world. Then my parents bought me a Lego set at the age of seven and I wanted to be a builder. I think at the age of nine, I went go-karting. Do you remember the first time you went go-karting? Anybody? Remember that? Yeah, you remember the experience, the adrenaline, the thrill? And then I wanted to be a race car driver. At about 13, I learned the art of debating with my parents because you're a teenager now. You don't need that much oversight. You're responsible. You can do things on you. And do you remember that? For me, it was about 13. For some of you, it was about six, right? Yeah. And so at 13, learning to debate with my parents about what I could and couldn't do, I discovered I had a gift for debating, and I decided that for the rest of my life I would be a, a lawyer. 
super excited. And then at about 14, I got my first computer. And I told my parents I had to get a computer because you could do homework on your computer, right? It just so happened that you could do a few other things on your computer as well, like games. And I was reading gaming magazines and I discovered that you could work, sorry my friends, you could work as a gamer. They pay you to play games every day and tell them if they're good or not. And so lawyer went out the door and gamer came in. And I thought, that's it. Can you imagine playing all day and getting paid for it? And you tell them, thumbs up or thumbs down. Fast forward a few years later, I'd finished my uni degree. I arrive into my first pastoral district. I had never been to a board meeting in my life. Never been to one. Not as a child, not as a young adult. I'd been to college. Somehow I managed to escape going to board meetings. I did a year of internship. The church I was at didn't have board meetings. Some of you are saying, hallelujah, what church is that? I want to go there. And so I get to the first district where I'm on my own, and I turn up to a board meeting for the very first time in my life. No idea what to expect. No idea what to do, really, either. Somebody had told me, fake it till you make it, and I thought I'd just try that. So I turn up to my board meeting. I still remember it. We're in the church hall, chairs in a circle, and I start doing what I thought was chairing the board meeting. Literally three minutes into the board meeting, one of the elders stands up, face red as a beetroot, and he points a finger at me. Right about now I'm praying, Lord, may you wither his hand like you did in the Old Testament to that bad king. And he says, that's not how you run a board meeting. I'm 22 at this stage, little life experience, never been to a board meeting, and here's this gentleman, bit of gray hair, telling me that's not how you run a board meeting. You know, I usually have a lot of quick, witty answers, but I was speechless. And praise the Lord, I was speechless, because three seconds later, the church clerk gets up, and she points a finger at the elder. And she says to him, now you sit down, you have no idea what you're talking about, we've never done board meetings that way. Right about now, I'm glad I didn't say anything because now she's saying something and she's having a go at him and he had a go at me. And just as she's about to sit down, somebody else gets up. And let's just say, within a few seconds, everybody's standing up pointing fingers at each other. How on earth do you run a board meeting? They eventually calmed down and I managed to fumble my way through. And I remember going back to the car after the board meeting. And we lived about 200 meters from the church. And I did not want to go home because my bride, my wife, was there and she was going to ask me how it went. And I felt sick in my stomach. I thought, what am I going to tell her about our board meeting? Why would anyone ever choose to go into ministry? Why would you choose to do it? I'm not sure if you've ever experienced or seen or maybe heaven forbid, even been involved in something like this. At the door, pastor, that was a lovely sermon. A little bit too long, but lovely. <laughs> pastor, I really like you sharing lots of stories in your sermon. The kids love the stories, but there wasn't a lot of meat in your sermon. I'm thinking, we're vegetarian. <laughs> well, meat in your sermon? Go to Macca's, they do hamburgers. Pastor, it's good that you're young and you've got lots of energy. Could you just do me a little favor and, and sit still in the pulpit and stop moving so much? Pastor, can't you be like one of those young preachers? You just hide behind the pulpit all the time. Can't you get out and move a little bit? Pastor, I watched something on YouTube the other day. I've noticed you're reading from the New King James Version a lot. I know you went to Avondale. 
but I'd like to tell you about Bible translations. So then you do King James Version for a few months until someone at the door, Pastor, what version were you reading from? Was that the Croatian Bible? I'm not Croatian. Oh, okay. Well, could you use a more modern version, please? Good to see you again, Pastor. Um, well, you, you haven't visited me for ages. I'd love a visit from you. I was there last month. Oh, yeah, but before last month. It's been ages. I was there two months ago. Well, before two months ago. You know what I mean. Do you want me to get my diary out? Don't worry about your diary. I'm just saying you don't visit me enough, Pastor. Pastor so-and-so said such and such. Could you please fix them? <sighs> Pastor, my car makes a funny noise when I brake. I think the brake pads are going. What are you doing on Sunday? <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning. I get a phone call. I've got to be careful. Two o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. As a pastor, most of us leave our phones on in case there's an emergency. People go through crisis, they go through problems, and praise the Lord, it is such a blessing that they often think of turning to the pastor for help first. Two o'clock in the morning, the phone rings, my wife's there, she's like, you better pick it up, what's going on? Answer the phone. Oh, good morning, pastor. Hope I didn't wake you up. <laughs> Wasn't even thinking of sleeping. I, I just got back into town, arrived by train. There's no taxis here. I don't have any money with me, and my house is like seven kilometers away. Like, what do you think I should do, Pastor? Well, I know I, th I think you should walk. <laughs> you ask what I think you should do, you know? You give me a lift home. I what else is there to do at two o'clock in the morning? I mean, nobody's doing anything. Can't even be on Facebook Messenger. They're all asleep. After about a year or two, maybe three, overheard at a church I was at literally a few months ago. The pastor was supposed to be doing a PowerPoint. And in his haste, he had mixed two of the slides up. So there was verse, verse, and chorus instead of verse, chorus, verse. Any one of you done that before? Maybe. And I overhear somebody say, he had one job to do. One job. He does nothing all week. And he couldn't get the PowerPoint right. Because what else do pastors do all week? Six months ago, overheard at lunch. Man, I sometimes think I should go into ministry. They do one sermon a week, then they don't have to do anything all week. Why would anyone... Choose to go into ministry. Two, three years into a district, you are starting to settle. You start to get to know people. You've solved and sorted World War Three and Four and Five. You've been able to manage to pick the color of the carpet without alienating too many people. And you finally start to breathe a sigh of relief because you know just how long your sermons have to be. 23 minutes and 47 seconds. You know exactly which version of the Bible to use and when. You know exactly when to turn your phone off. And you come home one evening after church and you say to your wife, you know, this is what ministry is supposed to be. That's just finally going so well. And she smiles and you smile and she smiles and you smile and everybody's smiling and the kids are smiling and then the phone rings. Ah, oh, yes, Mr. President, how are you? Because the conference president rings up. Oh, going well. Great Sabbath. Yeah, we're really enjoying it. You know, it's fantastic. Things are going well. We're reaching people for the kingdom. Church is filling up. Things are going fantastic. Oh, so good, so good. You're doing a fantastic job there, young man. That's really great. Good, 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 good for you. What can I do for you? Well, we've prayed and the spirit has moved. And now it's your turn to move. And then you go and you break the good news to your wife, who is elated, excited. She can't wait to pack some more boxes. And thankfully, there are still some boxes that are unpacked in the garage, so it's not even as much as last time because 
It's the call you've all been waiting for. Pack your bags, move, and start all over again. Why would anyone ever want to get into ministry? We're going to look at one of the first ordinations in the Bible. It's found in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 27. Now, it's debatable as to which one was the first ordination because there were different forms in the Old Testament of ordination and different words as well. But this is one that's very powerful, very visual, very clear, and it uses a Hebrew word that in the Old Testament is most prominently used for the concept of ordination, consecration, dedication, appointment. Numbers chapter 27, verse 18. The Lord replied, Take Joshua, son of Nun, who has the Spirit in him, and lay your hands on him. This is one of the first clear, powerful experiences we have of the concept of laying on of hands for the sake of appointing, ordaining, consecrating, commissioning somebody to the call of leadership in the Bible. Now, before we dive deeper into it, I want to notice, I want you to notice something interesting. It first says, take this Joshua, the son of Nun, who, past tense, or present, don't quote me, I, uh, yep, my Hebrew's a little bit rusty. But Joshua already has something. What does he have? He already has the Spirit. Why would anybody choose a career in ministry? Well, let me make it very clear, nobody chooses a career in ministry. You don't wake up one morning and say, what career will I try this month, this year? For the next five years, maybe I'll try being a pastor because they don't have to work. Once a week, that's it. Ministry is not something you call yourself to. And I interact with a lot of young people who are questioning whether they have been called to ministry. And my advice to them always is, if you haven't been called, don't answer. And when you've been called, it is so overwhelming and so clear and so consuming that nothing else goes through your mind. And every day you resist that call is a day where you feel the pressure, the call, the sense of urgency that you're doing something you shouldn't and you should go and do ministry. And that's not because we choose it, but because this is what God does. Why does he do it? We could posture, we could guess. I know for me and for many pastors it'd be true. God calls us because if we did anything else, we would be lost. God knows our personality, our character, our attitude, our behavior, our propensities to selfishness and sin. And he says the only way you can find hope is by actually ministering to others. For many of us, the call to ministry is an opportunity for us first to be saved. For others, it may be different. And why God chooses and calls, that's his prerogative. But the call to ministry... Is something that God does and something that is visible long before you go to Avondale College, long before you finish your degree, and long before we stand up here and ordain someone like Daniel. The call to ministry is something that God places, that the Spirit moves, and is evident in ordination. It's not a transfer of privilege, but it's an acknowledgement and recognition of what the Spirit has done and is doing and will continue to do. Take Joshua, son of Nun, who has a spirit in him, and lay your hands on him. The word there in Hebrew is samak. Hebrew scholars might pronounce it differently, but we'll just go with samak. That's easy enough. And one of the fascinating things about the Hebrew language is that they don't have too many words. We've got about half a million words in English, and every single day, some new celebrity invents some new words, right? And next year, they have to add some new words to the dictionary. But in the Hebrew language, there were around two to 3,000 base words, derivatives of those words, but not very many, which meant that most words had much deeper, richer, more holistic meaning because they meant more things. And the word samak, which is laying on of hands here, has a lot of significance for this concept of ordination. The first thing that it conveys is this concept of transference. And if you actually read verse 20, it says, transfer or impart some of your authority to him so the whole community of Israel will obey him. And ordination is not a a new experience where the person now is all of a sudden capable, but it's a recognition of what God has done and a transference of the church 
In this case, it was Moses to Joshua. But for us as a church, in the transference of authority, of recognition what God has done, and an acceptance that this is a call of God. God is working in your life. And that's what we're doing today. Daniel has been a pastor. He's worked in that space. We've seen the evidence of the Spirit working in and through him. But today as a church, locally, at a conference level, at a national level, at an international level, where you're saying we are transferring authority on him as a spiritual leader, as a guide in our church, which is why ordination, once bestowed at a local church, applies internationally for us. So the first thing is transference. The, th- the second thing actually implies being sustained or sustaining, because the word samak is almost like holding something, holding something well, holding it tightly and sustaining it. And ordination is not only what Daniel can do for us. Do you remember those posters? Think not what your country would, can do for you. Think what you can do for your country. Remember those? Ordination isn't just about, now that Daniel is ordained, think what he can do for us. Ordination also implied a commitment from the person doing the transference. In our case, we as a church, a commitment to sustain and to hold. Did you catch that? Pastors don't need any support. They don't need any prayers. In fact, they don't have normal human emotions. They don't get tired. They don't get hungry. They don't get sick. Right? And their wives are always happy because they don't have any problems. And their children, you don't even have to change their diapers. Because they're toilet trained when they're born. Because pastors are supernatural, right? Yeah. They have to always smile. They have to always have the answers. They have to know every intricacy of the Greek and Hebrew language. And they should be able to do it in Latin as well for for add bonus. Right? Which is why, as a church, we can come and absolutely dump everything on them because they have nothing better to do, no problems, no worries, no stress, right? Hey, they said yes to the call, now it's on them. And in the Bible, that was the journey of many leaders, alone. And sometimes, even in our churches, pastors travel through the journey alone. Because when the pastor's not smiling, what's wrong, pastor? Pastor? Uh, You know, my wife and I, we we had a bit of a, we we saw things differently. (sighs) Ah, By the time you've told that person, and then you walk around the back and you go to the hall, everybody in the hall knows that you and your wife had an argument. And there's nothing better than the entire church knowing what's happening in your own personal life, right? It just thrills you. you. You say to them, well, maybe you can share it on Facebook as well. Yeah, my, my friends in Melbourne don't know. No, pastors are human. Pastors do not get supernatural powers. They are not somehow endowed with strength and abilities that the average person just doesn't possess. They are not made of steel. They bleed like you bleed, and their emotions are exactly like yours and amplified because of the amount of people that they're supporting, they're ministering to, and they're caring for. Which means that ordination isn't a step where we say, finally, up until now, Daniel's been asking us to do some things. And we've done it because he wasn't ordained. Now he's ordained. We don't have to do anything. He's going to do it all. Part of the process of ordination is a recognition that we, who transfer ordination upon him as a church community and family, commit to sustain him. And by him, I mean Stephanie. And the children, they are a family unit. And part of the concept of laying on of hands is not just transfer, but holding, sustaining, supporting. Does that make sense? And so this isn't a ceremony purely and solely for Daniel. We're not celebrating solely what Daniel has done, what him and Steph have been doing. This is, a, this is like a marriage where two people come to the party and make commitments to each other. We make a commitment as a church that we've seen enough evidence of the Spirit moving that we entrust Daniel to do what God has called him to do. But we're also committing to sustain and support him. That goes for us as a local church. It goes for the conference, for the union. It goes for his peers and colleagues everywhere, ministerial. We're here to sustain Daniel. And it is okay for pastors to have bad days. Is that okay? 
Yeah? And it's okay for his wife not to have to always smile. Is that okay? Yeah? Because sometimes she hasn't slept all night with the kids, cooking, preparing, ministering, serving. And it's okay for pastor's wives to be human because they never said yes to the call. (laughs) They're stuck with it. They just had to come along. But we're committing to support them. The pastor supports each of us every single day. And you don't have to support him. You know, give up your day job because you're supporting the pastor. But if each of you do your part a little bit here and there, he and Steph will be supported in ministry. And that's what ordination is, a symbol of transference, yes, but sustainment as well. The third and final thing that this word samak implies is the concept of sacrifice. The same word is used for the laying on of hands on the sacrificial lamb. It's the same concept. Remember the concept of transference. In a sacrifice, you're actually transferring sins from yourself to the animal. The word of sustaining. You know, when someone brought an animal to be sacrificed, it wasn't arm's length laying hands on. Can you imagine? I want you to visualize this because this is what we imagine. We imagine the priest putting a hand on the animal and then sacrificing it, killing it. Which animal do you think is going to stay there with you putting its hand on its back? Do you think any animal is just going to stay there and wait? They can sense it. They can feel it. So it wasn't, when it says that they laid hands, it wasn't a, I'm going to touch the lamb. It was actually holding and embracing the lamb. The concept of sustenance, even in the midst of its sacrifice, the lamb was being held, sustained, loved by the person who had come to sacrifice it which is a beautiful picture of Jesus on Calvary. Even though he couldn't feel his father, why have you forsaken me? Heaven has not forgotten its son. Samak had the association of laying on of hands, holding, sustaining, transferring for the purpose of sacrifice. And you know, when someone accepts the call to ministry, they are making a sacrifice. Their families make sacrifices. The average pastor only lives in about 14 homes in their lifetime. Can you imagine the impact that has on children, moving schools? You know, for pastors, it's a lot easier to make new friends because from day one, you get into a church and everybody says, sees, has, experiences you as the pastor. And so they're talking to you because, you know, they're engaging in ministry, wanting something, talking, sharing. It's a lot harder for the pastor's wives and for their children. It takes them longer to settle in. And by the time they're settling in, maybe it's time to move for whatever good reason. There's a sacrifice there. Financially, every time you buy and sell a house, you lose money. I have three pastors that are new in our conference and they can't find rent. Two of them are living in caravan parks. One pastor, young guy. You've got to love young pastors. Lots of energy. They can save the world. They know all the answers. He rings me up. He says, I just can't find a house to rent. And, you know, after all these years in ministry, I can still be a little bit judgmental. God have mercy on me. So I said to him, okay, okay, look, keep looking and we'll support you. We'll do what we can. And then I got online. And you know what I thought? This is me being honest. I I thought, I'm going to go and look up for a house. I'm going to find him a house and I'm going to send him the link to the house. Right? Because he said he can't find anything. And so I Googled the area and I clicked the box that says surrounding suburbs you know the one you look up for a house in surrounding suburbs and I've never experienced anything like this but for rental in the town that we'd asked him to move to and the surrounding suburbs within 100 kilometers it said zero search results found living in a caravan but they said yes to the call of God because when God calls and grips you there is nothing else that you can do The concept of ordination is also a recognition of sacrifice that the pastors make and that their families make and that their children make. They don't just make it when they move, they make it every day. Because pastors, we tell them to keep boundaries, but pastors love their people. And very few pastors can keep boundaries because they love you, they care for you. They wake up every morning and believe it or not, they're thinking about you. What do I do? How can I serve? How can I support? How can I reach? How can I care for this person? And so even though it's family time, even though they have a day off, most pastors still still leave their phones on. (laughs) And they still answer those calls. 
And they haven't had a day off for three weeks because even on Sabbath they're doing stuff. And then it's a church working bee and the wife desperately needs him to work at home. But he says, no, I'm going to the church working bee. I want to be with my people. Pastors sacrifice. An ordination is a recognition. It's an appreciation. It's us getting together and saying thank you. Thank you for accepting the call. Thank you for doing what not all of us are called to do and what some of us have resisted to do and some of us don't want to do. Thank you. We transfer authority to you to be a leader, a spiritual leader, a guide. We promise to sustain you. We will hold you. We will uphold you. We will be there for you as you were there for us. And we recognize and we appreciate the sacrifice that you make for us. Young men come up to me. Young women come up and they say, I'm feeling called to ministry. Tell me a little bit about ministry. And this is what I say to them. Ministry is not a career. It's not a job like any other. Ministry is a call that has the highest highs. When you're in ministry and you see the Holy Spirit working in someone's life and you see their eyes sparkle and you see life flowing through them as you're opening the Bible, nothing compares to that. You get one of those experiences every three months and you forget all of the challenges of ministry. When you're studying the Bible with a young person and you see maturity and development from childhood to adulthood and they respond to Jesus and they want to give their life to Jesus and you baptize them, there is nothing greater than that. When you're sitting by the bedside of somebody that's terminally ill and they're concerned and worried and fearful for their eternal salvation, but you open the Bible to them and you explain to them who Jesus is and what he's done. And yes, they've been members for 50 years, but they never got it. But there at the gravesite, as you're sharing the Bible with them, you see that person in pain and in agony, physically and spiritually. You see the light bulb come on, and you know that as they're going to their rest, they've accepted Jesus as their Savior. There's nothing better than that. You get someone coming to your stand and you give them a book and you see the Holy Spirit work, there's nothing better than that. You get a phone call, someone walks into church because they've been listening to radio, seeing you on YouTube, saw a leaflet. There is nothing better than seeing lives changed because it's eternal. Every other career is temporal. You build someone's house, it's for a few years. You heal someone at the hospital, it's a few years. You win their court case, it's a few years. You fly them to Melbourne, it's a few years. Everything is temporal, but ministry is eternal in its impact, in its scope. Ministry has the highest highs. In some ways, I wish everybody had the chance to experience what pastoral ministry is. And you talk to most pastors, they wouldn't trade it for the world because they get to see those experiences. You preach a sermon, I've done this so many times, you preach a sermon, and it's a bomb. It's a disaster. You look at your wife at the back, and on the way out, you ask your wife, in fact, you don't even ask, because you know it was a terrible sermon the way she looks at you. <laughs> you know, almost with sympathy and pity in your eyes. And she's trying to avert your eyes, because she doesn't want you to ask her what you thought, what she thought, right? Right? But then someone comes at the door and says, the Holy Spirit spoke to me through that. God touched my heart. And then you say, wow, what a privilege. A broken, useless vessel like me with a terrible sermon that God has used to impact someone for eternity. Ministry has the highest highs. There's no job, no profession, no career, no vocation. That comes even close to ministry. And I've done a lot of different jobs, so I can speak from experience. It also has the lowest lows because it becomes personal, because the devil will attack a pastor more than anyone else, because if you can disperse, if you can attack the shepherd, you disperse the sheep, the highest highs and the lowest lows. And so I say to young people that talk to me, if you're called, it will sustain you through the lows, because when it's dark, only that voice of God saying, go this way and nothing else takes you through those things. We don't choose to become pastors. Daniel didn't choose it. His parents didn't tell him to do it. And I'm sure they had many aspirations for him. I don't know if ministry is the aspiration for most parents anyway. It doesn't pay well enough. But Daniel has said yes because God has called him and has called him to sacrifice his life, his family's life, for the sake of eternal life for others, to share the good news, to strengthen the church, to train the church, to equip for good works so that others may come to know Jesus. And today, as we ordain him, keep those three things in mind. We are transferring authority. Respect Daniel 
Yes, we're all called to do some form of ministry, but we're not all called to be pastors of the church. Respect the authority that we invest in him, that you invest in him as a spiritual leader of this church. It is a high calling. Sustain him and his family. Put your arms around him. Pray for him. Support him. Encourage him. Every now and again, if he preaches too long, just hold back and don't tell him. If it's too short, don't tell him. Just support him. And finally, appreciate, thank him, and affirm him and his family for the sacrifices that they make. I just want to finish with uh, the words of Paul to one of his protégés. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God, be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke and encourage your people with good teaching. That's what Daniel will do, and that's what he'll do well with your prayers and support. At this point, we have our ministerial charge, and this is the same charge that our pastors respond to across the planet. And um, it, it is about the call. It includes those words, Christian. And today, we are affirming God's call. We're also affirming that as a worldwide Adventist church, we recognize in Daniel the competencies of pastoral ministry, but more importantly, the character for pastoral ministry. And over a period of time, we've seen you know, Daniel evidence those gifts and the fruits of the Spirit and the character that we say we affirm this calling, this competence, this character. Also today, and after that sermon, Christian, I get to invite anyone who senses God's call in their life to pastoral ministry. If that's something you've thought about, if that's something as, that, as Christian talked today, even you're thinking, I'd like to explore this more, then um, by all means, talk to Pastor Christian, talk to Christian, talk to, to Justin. I'd love to talk to you as well and look at what that journey might look like for you. But at this point, I invite... Daniel and Stephanie and William and Arlene, if they would like to join as well. Stephanie said, let's see how they're going at that point of the afternoon. So let's see how it's working. But if you'd like to join up the front here for our, our pastoral charge. And I'd also like to invite any of our pastors who have joined us this afternoon who have, have responded to this charge previously. If you could also stand where you are and... Um, this is, can be a moment of reaffirming your charge to pastoral ministry as well. So, come over this way. So, Daniel, God has called you to the work of pastoral ministry. And the church, in recognizing that call, will today set you aside by the laying on of hands. Your ordination is recognized by the Adventist church worldwide, but such honor involves great responsibility. I charge you to minister as a servant, remain humble, remain teachable, and make the master your lifelong study. By spending time with Jesus, you become like him. It is by beholding that you become changed. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in truth, and in purity. I charge you to minister as a shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. I charge you to minister as a watchman. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the ministry that God has called you to. I charge you to minister as a teacher. Nourish the people in words of faith and in good doctrine that you have carefully followed. Feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And when your work is ended, Daniel, may you say with Paul, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith, and therefore there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved and longed for his appearing. I'd like to invite Pastor Christian, who will lead us in the prayer, and those who are standing to join us.
Let's kneel together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today because you have brought Daniel into ministry. You have brought Daniel and Stephanie to this place as a ministry couple. You have guided and you have led them and we thank you for that. Today we bring them to you because they are yours and we have laid our hands on Daniel because this is a symbol of asking you for a, an outpouring of your spirit in full measure into his life and his ministry. I pray that you will continue to work through him, that you will give him strength and courage to face whatever challenges may come, that you will give him success and encouragement day by day, that he will know that you are working through him, that you will be with Stephanie and with the children and that they will know that you are the one who is keeping them close together and close to you. And so today we bring him to you because we know that you have already ordained that Daniel should be a pastor. And so we bring him to you and we put him in your hands that you may live out your life through him and that his ministry may be full. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we play that video? Um, the, uh guests and friends and families that come to the ordination of uh, Pastor Daniel Ma. Daniel, I want to praise the Lord and also share with you some encouragement. It's a sad thing that I couldn't make it today, but I have loved to be there because I've seen what God is doing in your life and I just want to thank God for that. I know
Thank you, everybody. I, I don't think I'll try to name everyone, but thank you all. When God first called me to be a pastor, I didn't know what that would look like or what it took. The path I imagined was a lonely one. I was told many times how difficult it was, especially by people who knew. People who knew ministry said I wasn't up to it, and they were probably right. But God was moving me, and I started doing ministry on my own. Then God led me to people who were doing the same thing, but they were not alone. They were not pastors, but they had power from God and support from their church. When I came to their church, the people accepted me as I was. It didn't matter if I couldn't fit in easily at their church or any church. They accepted me just as I was. As I attended this new church, I observed their joy in serving Jesus Christ. And I quickly realized, perhaps for the first time, 
that I had a lot to learn. These keepers of the law understood the gospel and lived it better than me. I was humbled by these humble people. I had to decrease and Jesus had to increase. There were many great men and women of God who were my teachers, reprovers, and trainers. I was also blessed over time by the ministry of ordained pastors who showed me by their example that pastoral ministry is about doing what is needed, not getting 100% on a test or fitting into a mould. It is the same example that I hope by God's grace to live. When I look back now, I know that those who discouraged me knew what they were talking about. Many, perhaps most, ordained pastors are lonely. I imagine this loneliness would be because of a lack of friends, but it is actually the opposite. We have more friends than we can be close to. We are told to go to God for superhuman endurance, but we only allow a tiny circle of people close enough to be part of God's answer to our cries for help. Too often that circle is the pastor's family who have their own challenges without carrying ours too. But I thank God that he has not made my path lonely. You are listening right now because you support and care for me. I have experienced the joy of walking my walk with Jesus, not alone, but with all those faithful ministers, men and women, who walk with me, ordained or not. This has been a blessing from God, not of myself. God has led you and others to care about me. Thank God and thank you. I take this, my ordination, very seriously, as I do most things. It is the fulfilment of a vow but only the beginning of so much more. And that more, frankly, scares me. I wish I could be a minister and just be like everyone else. I always prick up my ears and I, I, I get excited when I hear something about narrowing the gap between clergy and laity. But there is something different about being ordained. I don't quite understand what, but I know it will take, I will take it with me for the rest of my life. I would not have chosen that, but God chose it for me. And I know that when God chooses something for me, that is where I want to be. That is where I will find joy, peace, and love. Joy and peace are found only in submission to the love of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this will be your experience too. Sorry, Stephanie, I know you probably just got settled down there, but do you mind joining us? If you you can't, it's okay. Folks, we're nearly completing our service. It's my privilege to give the formal welcome to ministry. Thank you for coming up. How you doing? Daniel, it's my privilege today to extend to you and your family welcome into the ranks of the gospel ministry. We welcome you on behalf of the Victorian Conference, and if I could be so bold, the Worldwide Church. We welcome you on behalf of your fellow ministers who share with you the joys and the rewards and the burdens of ministry. Don't hesitate to lean on us. Ministers are a source of wise counsel and experience that will assist you in your ministry. You're now part of a worldwide tribe of men and women who have answered the same call that you've felt. You may at times experience loneliness, but you will never be alone. Mm. We welcome you on behalf of all of the congregations within Victoria who you will serve. May you hold them up before God 
And may they hold you up and sustain you in their prayers and may they work with you well in ministry. We welcome you, Stephanie and William and Arlene. To the families of ministers, Daniel couldn't do what he does without you. Adam and Eve were given the charge together by God. So to whatever extent you're able to or willing to, join with Daniel in ministry and develop something that could be fulfilling to you both. Your life as a couple will be an example to the believers and a source of wonder sometimes to non-believers as well. And so I want to welcome you as well on behalf of the friends and families that are here today. They love and they pray for you every day. They remember that you are called to this work. And I ask you to remember that you can fully trust in Jesus as you walk forward into ordained ministry. And when at last you'll stand victorious with those for whom you have laboured and prayed and suffered, you'll hear the words of your Saviour. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. And so you will be made ruler over many. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. Here's some flowers for you. And let me give you these. Maybe Here we go. Maybe your helper can carry that. If anyone wanted to take a photo, Michael, you put your camera ready there. Thank you. I think a round of applause, folks. Here we are very grateful that um, God has seek and God has called um, Daniel and have saved his life and also to use his life to bless the other people. So we are grateful that God has been seeking the lost like um, each one of us here. So let's rise and we'll sing Seeking the Lost. Awesome. Sorry, so in the chorus, um, there is main part, so the man, the man will start and then the lady can echo. Seeking the Lord, yeah, kindly entreating, wonders on the mountain and stray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the master speaking to the gentleman.
Let's uh, close this special service with prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the call that you have given to each and every one of us here to go on missions of mercy. Um, Lord, together we just acknowledge the high calling of pastoral ministry too. And again, we just uh, want to say thank you for the calling that you've placed upon Daniel and Stephanie and the family. Bless them, Lord. And Father, if there's anyone here today that has uh, had a small voice whispering in their ear, you also have that special call. You need to go into full-time uh, ministry. Oh, Lord, give them the courage to come and speak to one of us here so that we might encourage them to follow through on your call. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>